Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. So number one, thank you for coming. Um, excited to talk with you today about uh, the book and share a little bit about you know, how it came about. Um, when, I, when I started you know, the CEO Quest, I was really sort of, it was very important to me to really sweat the research into the applied science of company building. I really felt that it would be important uh, not just to lever my you know, LinkedIn profile and backgrounds and you know, personal experience, uh, but I was very conscious of the fact that in the moments that I get the privilege to sit down with a CEO and have a conversation in a coaching moment, uh, that those are really important moments. And I have a responsibility to do the best I can to provide good advice, advice that has been grounded in good thinking, in best practice, in a sense of um, you know, a, a appropriate relevance for the real issue that that company faces. And so um, when I started CEO Quest, I really uh, was serving a diversity of, of CEOs, um, some of whom are actually, I'm looking at one of them right in the room right now, <laughs> when we first got started, but different business models. And I began to want to document, like, what are some of the practices that I'm observing inside these companies? What are some of the things, the patterns that are beginning to emerge? That document turned into an Excel spreadsheet. That Excel spreadsheet turned into 3,000 lines and about 40 rows, and it became a taxonomy. And out of that taxonomy came a book. And that's the book that I want to share with you today. So uh, I forgot the clicker. <laughs> um, so I think just to ground ourselves, you know, um, I believe that companies sort of are built in five domains, right? Uh, belief is at the center. Uh, what you believe uh, and who must believe. And, and that includes, uh, obviously, your investors, your customers, and your employees. Uh, surrounding that, we have product design, people design, revenue design, and systems design. And, and my, my mission, if I can pull it off, is, is to write the five books that relate to this. So uh, about a third of the way through book four. Um, but obviously, what happens at this stage is very different right, than what happens at this stage. And so what I'm going to do as I begin to get into the revenue engine stuff, and we're, we're obviously just going to fly at the surface of this, uh, is I want to provide a little bit of context. And then we're just going to focus on three key things that are part of, of the book. Um, so you know, obviously, what happens at various stages of scaling. So, uh, Bruce Cleveland uh, is the uh, founder of not just is uh, the founding uh, partner at Wildcat, but uh, and the guy that's going to be interviewing me in a few minutes, um, but is also the head and founder of uh, the Traction Gap Institute, and he conceived of these first five stages of company building, right? Like d describing not just minimum viable product, what happens after that? Minimum viable repeatability, minimum viable traction, and with his permission. He allowed me to keep going and, and to keep defining other stages of scaling. And I've actually found this very relevant in, in not just this book, but in other uh, subsequent books that I've written. That, that, you know, coming back to this model, what, what's required of the CEO, what's required of the executive team at each stage of scaling changes. And you have to almost shift your whole approach to leadership to address the things that are required early versus the things that are required later. Um, now, when we get to the revenue engine, we're going to be talking a little bit about the engine, right? How to make that engine go, how to acquire customers more efficiently and effectively. But we should never lose sight of the fact that the whole engine sits on the foundation of product market fit. That in the absence of a connection with a customer, right, we got nothing. So it felt appropriate to me that we should we should start by anchoring in this concept of you know, your emerging hypothesis of what, if you're an early stage company, it's just a hypothesis. The way I like to say it is hypotheses bend towards truth as you scale, right? You begin to learn what the market's reality is and you find your way to truth. And, and this is just vital. You know, if you shoot past this, think you got product market fit when you don't, right? You're in trouble. And that's what we don't want to have happen. We want to make sure we got product market fit. But if you do, you have the opportunity to sort of 
enter into a whole new set of interesting problems. <laughs> so um, at this stage, you have to then build out your engine. Now, there's only three key concepts I'm going to mention in this part of the, of the conversation, OK? Uh, the first is related to uh, the concept of LTV. The second is related to the concept of stage. And then the third, we're going to talk a little bit about segmentation, which I think is the key to the whole deal. Um, it, it's it, the lifetime value of your product. Hello? Uh, I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> C comprises the uh, boundary condition of your um, revenue engine, right? If you are a company, I'll just give you an example. So uh, hold on. I got that. Excuse me. I'm working on the stage item first, and then I'll go to the other one. Sorry about that. So obviously, stage matters. The company that looks like this is very different like this. And I think it sort of manifests in four ways, right? So the first is, you know, in the earliest stages of B2B SaaS company, the, rev the entirety of the revenue engine is the CEO, virtually. They're running around getting the first deals. They're, they're marketing, they're sales, they're the whole deal. But of course, as you scale, uh, you begin to break down and, and deconstruct work, atomize work, and it, it begins to get segmented into more and more tasks. Similarly, you start off chaotic. Uh, I sure did. <laughs> in my startup, but as you go along, you begin to you know, bear down and figure out the inefficiencies in your processes and workflows. And you begin to make it um, eventually a continuously improving environment. Uh, obviously, there's this shift from manual to automated. And then finally, from unmeasured to, to measured, to, to highly data-driven. And that's the journey from a stage point of view. The other one is LTV. Um, the lifetime value really matters. We had earlier, he had to leave early, uh, David Kopp. David's the CEO of Healthline. Um, and I served him as, as his coach for a period of time. Very successful, you know, heading towards probably 100 million revenue media company. Do you know the, the value, the lifetime value of each consumer that goes to Healthline? It's nine cents. Nine cents. What does that mean? That means they can invest up to three cents on the principle of LTV over CAC being greater than three to acquire a new customer, right? Another customer I served was uh, Lumiata. Lumiata sells in, also in the healthcare space. They sell to big insurance company, predictive analytics solutions for over a million bucks per customer. They can spend how much? 330,000 bucks to acquire a customer, a little bit different, right? So obviously, the revenue engines we have when you're down here, very high LTV, right? We're in the world of account-based marketing. This is something Bruce has written a lot about and thought a lot about, advised me when I was writing this book. He gave me some real brilliant insights that I incorporated and stole from him. <laughs> um, but uh, on the other end, Healthline. Healthline is one of the best companies in the world at optimizing uh, search engine optimization, right? They can't have human activity to chase three cents. It's got to be all digital. And across that continuum, LTV is the vital thing to talk about when you want to get started on the question of boundaries of an engine, right? The boundary condition of the revenue engine is lifetime value, first and foremost. So what is the revenue engine? We're all used to living in, in the bow tie world, right? Which is you know top, mid, bottom, launch, stabilize, expand. Right? That's, the, that's the prospect and customer journey. And obviously, that's where the action all happens. Right, That is absolutely key. What you do there is the moment of truth. That's when it all comes together. But I would submit the quality of your orchestrated activity in the bow tie is fundamentally anchored in what you do down here, in what I call the foundation layers. So in the mission and strategy area, we have um, you know, value proposition, competitive positioning, brand identity, segmentation, um, uh, pricing, channel architecture. There's all these strategic product. There's all these strategic considerations. Yes, product is part of the revenue engine um, that, that are going to anchor and need to be coordinated and, and integrated together holistically in a systemic solution so that you can uh, 
create a powerful impact at the moment of truth when you're engaging consumers and customers. Um, similarly, I would argue that the financial plan is part of the revenue engine because that's the system by which we account for whether the business is working. The unit economics flow through the financial plan and expose to us whether this is a business ready to go to guys like Bruce and raise a ton of money and pour into the engine, or whether we got to retrench and keep small and iterate until we get the model right. Tools and information architecture, what I call the messaging schema, which is all the playbooks. This is your you know, brand playbook, your growth marketing, uh, product marketing, sales development rep playbook, your account executive playbook, your customer success playbooks. Those six playbooks are the messaging schema, but they depend on the stuff down here, right? Value prop, competitive positioning, things like that. So um, you have these roles that you can apply in the engine, key functions, and you have these variables, people, tool, workflow, and, metri uh, and, and uh, metrics. And these are the elements that you have to put together in your design of your engine, right? So what, what I'm just going to focus on briefly now, and then we'll open it up where uh, Bruce will get up and ask me a few questions, and then we'll open it up to questions from the room. I really want to spend a moment on segmentation. So segmentation is, I think, the most critical thing of all. We, we have argued that, um, you know, obviously an early stage startup does not have the capacity to conduct a comprehensive analysis of, um, it with, you know, statistical reliability across some sort of, you know, complicated, comprehensive um, research project. Uh, but at bare minimum, uh, I believe you need to do at least this, which we call the um, 50 use case scenarios exercise, where you identify 50 use cases of, of your product and you answer a series of questions about them. You know, who's the buyer? What's the pain point? But get it down to the use case level and then roll up to segments. Now, there's a company in the audience, Obo here, uh, Pete Sinclair is the CEO, who's doing research on product that relates to trying to validate uh, need and, and, and pain point and value and confirm. And so there are tools out there that can support this. But the fundamental point is you can't afford some kind of $200,000 research project, but you can't afford to wing it either. Got to do that thing at least in the middle. And when you go through this 50 use case scenarios exercise, which is in the book, um, one of the steps is for all the cells you've filled out, how confident are you that you're, tr that you're accurate? and your green, yellow, red it. And when you expose the areas that you're not sure you're accurate, those are the places where, okay, I gotta call up some customers inside that use case and firm up my understanding. And by that iterative process, we get to a clearer segmentation scheme. When you have it nailed at the atomic level, now you can group them, stick them into buckets, identify your top two or three segments, but you've done it with a little bit of rigor. Now, why I think that's valuable is it sort of powers everything else. One of my favorite examples of a company that I think has gotten product right. Who's the, mancrates.com is, is a place you can get products for men, okay? Who is the audience for this website? Huh? Women, exactly right. And so the entire site takes a total tongue in cheek look at men, okay? Totally, you know, overdoes the, you know, tough man thing and has fun with it in a really fun way and it is taken off. That's a great example of deeply understanding your customer, resonate, you know, creating something resonant. Um, so it also affects segmentation that if you deeply understand the segment you're serving, you understand what resonates and you understand how to achieve effective competitive positioning. Effective competitive positioning is, is, is identifying your value proposition and then conveying it in a way that boxes in your competitors. And there's none that I've found better than this one. Lay rubber where your carbon footprint used to be. It totally boxes in the gas-powered vehicle. Yet it, it sort of puts these guys in with the high-performing Porsches and, and other types of vehicles. So sort of cool. Um, Teen Zuo from Zuora uh, went public this year. Uh, he, uh, at an event at Wildcat, I had the privilege of uh, interviewing him uh, on the stage. And, we talked about this. He has, I thought, done as good a job as anybody I've ever seen in, in the area of thought leadership. And because he deeply understands the segments that he wants to attack. 
He's got clarity that he has a B2C subscription segment, a B2B subscription segment, and what he calls corporations in transformation. And so, you know, freedom to grow, freedom to adapt, freedom to reinvent. He's defined his value proposition and his thought leadership around this notion of the subscription economy. And he's coined the term and write books, written books about it. Um, segmentation also defines your sales structure. It allows you to clarify uh, exactly how to attack the segment that you seek to serve. Um, and it helps you define your workflows. So, you know, all these things emerge out of a deep understanding of who you're seeking to reach. And if you think about it, if you take the method of engagement, which workflows and orchestration gives you, and then messaging, where you define your messaging in a way that is super crisp to achieve what we call the three locks, right? Vision lock, I get what you do and why it's relevant for me. Conviction lock, I'm convinced, sign me up. And advocacy lock, I'm a raving fan. Those are the three message proof points that have got to get accomplished. So if you get the messaging right and the engagement right, we've got it nailed in, in the context of your lifetime value boundary. And pricing. So what stage in the audience do we have? So um, how many companies are below a million in revenue that are here today? OK. How many are from a million to five million? OK. How many are above five million? OK. So it's, it's sort of a, a rough mix. Obviously, the maturity of your workflow is natively related to the stage you're in. But that doesn't mean that we want to sit back and accept it, 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 a, a suboptimal workflow, right? We, we, no matter what stage you're in, you're always working hard to, to improve it. Um, the the uh, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon Capability uh, Maturity Model posits that there's five stages of uh, maturity. The first is sort of the chaotic step. Uh, the second is when you have begun to recognize some broken process and you've fixed it. You haven't fixed the stuff around it, but you've fixed that process that you prioritized. In stage three, you're beginning to get the linkages between processes, get the handoffs cleaned up, and start to optimize around that. Stage four, you're starting to measure the steps in that process. And stage five, you're a data-driven company where employees are optimized to use data to continuously improve the processes. And so we can think of that question at the sort of macro level. But uh, in the book, there's uh, 29 different components of the revenue engine that we actually uh, present in, in there a, um, an end state and ask you to measure one to five where you think you are against that end state. So the end state is sort of, if it was perfect, here's what it might look like, where are you? And by doing that, it allows you to sort of identify, OK, here are the challenges. That's going to help you prioritize the projects. Because change happens through two ways, right? Incremental continuous improvement, definitely critical. right? Kaizen, it's, it's a critical way to get change to happen. But it's also going to be the bulldozers of change, which are projects, right? And, and how you choose to mobilize a project is a big resource choice. These kinds of tools can help you think through which ones to prioritize in what order so that you get your engine optimized. Now, obviously, it's not so simple to sit back and work all day on your engine. right? You actually have to drive to work every day. You've got to pull in customers on a day-by-day -day basis. So it leaves you in the reality that you're going to execute as best you can day by day with the engine you have. And at night, you're going to work on improving the engine. right? That's the reality of life that you're going to be in. Uh, but you do that with something in mind, a vision in mind, right? That is that as you get through that build, measure, learn cycle, you will eventually be in a situation that you have the engine you want. And so in essence, when I think about what scaling the revenue engine is about, it's about having clarity as to the components of a good engine in the context of your lifetime value, in the context of your stage, right? And then working tirelessly, largely through sort of the scientific method of you know, hypothesizing, iterating, optimizing, building, and executing to get to the point where your engine's starting to perform pretty well. And when you do it well, uh, you are going to be companies like Zawara and companies like some of the uh, CEO Quest companies we have work, working with now that are scaling at a very, very rapid rate. Uh, I, I'm seeing Shailu here from Dispatch Track and others that are are sort of on that path. So 
but my final message with uh, you is that um, you know, remember it's all about the customer. You know, the engine <coughs> is second. First, we got to have product market fit. Uh, and with that, may the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>